Poverty has always been difficult. According to the theory of purchasing power parity in a perfectly operating market, the price of a given thing should be the same everywhere. But markets are, as it turns out, decidedly imperfect. Gasoline can change prices in a block. A Big Mac in Norway costs twice as much as a Big Mac in Mexico City. The costs of things make a problematic barometer, so economists have to look elsewhere to quantify comparative wealth and poverty. Life expectancy is one, of, one effective measure of so-called real wealth, as is a country's infant mortality rate. Death, it turns out, death, it turns out, is a symptom of poverty. Lying wounded on a gurney inside that dilapidated clinic in La Paz, this made sense to Gabriel. In the world's poorest countries, death is everywhere. If civil war doesn't get you, it will be famine, cholera, or a pinky toe hangnail that gets infected and that goes haywire. A 65-year-old Rwandan is as statistically improbable as a 100-year-old Canadian. Such is the danger of poverty. And although Bolivia was nowhere near as afflicted, afflicted a place as Rwanda, there could be no escaping death, death's proximity. People were swimming it. Miners set off dynamite in the middle of the day on the capital city's main drag. Yes, but there was more to it than that. To Gabriel, the shadow of death was implied somehow in the beggar's diseased eyes and in the vintage equipment at the clinic. It was there, too, in a lurid old bus's shaky rear wheel and in a lack of expiration dates on perishable food. The threat tried to be flippant on the death road it, between La Paz and Coroico, a popular destination for daredevil mountain bikers who were supposed to be delighted by the fact that more than 100 people were killed on the road every year. Death in that ubiquity seemed to beg for intervention by a sense of humor. You take the often countered carcasses of street dogs, furry legs protruding from bloated torsos. Is it a cold nightmare or black comedy? A person's response might depend on how many times he'd seen one. The first time, he might retch. The second time, he'd probably just avert his eyes. Eventually, though, after he'd seen enough, laughter would seem like the only sensible answer. To take it seriously, to give it that much meaning, would be unthinkable. Amid such violence and chaos, death came to seem an impatient mistress. The danger had never bothered Gabriel before. When he fell in love with Bolivia while in college, he didn't consider himself a potential object of death's caprice. Now Gabriel was afraid. It wasn't just the obvious things either that spooked him. He worried about contaminated water, feebly constructed buildings, nests of live wires that teetered atop telephone poles. The precariousness of everything astounded him. In January 2002, his mother had sent him a clipping from the LA Times about how, it's actually a true story, um, about how on the last day of 2001, a vendor in Lima's fireworks market had been demonstrating one of his wares for a customer when the whole market had ignited in a multicolored inferno. Within an hour, 276 people were dead, and the whole market, the size of a city block, had been reduced to ash. Scores of people had been incinerated in their cars as they sat in gridlock outside. Gabriel and his mother had been to that market when they were on their tour of the region the previous year. Lima had been their last stop after Chile and Bolivia, and they had stayed for only two days. On the second day, they took a tour of the city during which they stopped at the fireworks market, where eager salesmen lit matches and ignited fuses to entice the gringos. That they might be in danger did occur to Gabriel in a way, but it seemed theoretical. His mother had not recoiled either, although he'd expected her to. She had wanted, he understood, to be close to the danger. Or more to the point, she didn't want to be seen as afraid. So they lingered, standing stiffly to the side, their, nose, their nostrils full, full of the sweet, nostalgia-laced smell of burning black powder, paper, and sulfur. Their eardrums tickled by the arrhythmic explosions. They watched until a bandolier of crackers began rattling off nearby, and she suggested, pretending to be bored by it now, or mildly annoyed by the racket, that they might step outside and wait for the others in the fresh air. Gabriel would never deliberately enter such a place now. Now he liked his fireworks to have prominent warning labels. Exclamation points were a plus. He liked seatbelt laws, too, and rules about airbags. He liked his Food and Drug Administration, with its random sanitation checks and obsessive rules. He liked his milk thoroughly pasteurized. 
All of this would have once seemed priggish to him, but now it made so much sense. More than anything, he liked how, in the developed world, although equally voracious in the end, death appeared less indiscriminate. Death made sense. It was, as it should be, an orderly, rational affair. Thank you.